You unshare your slide. Yeah. So I just um, we don't need any volume. Good. Yes, of the PowerPoint, you will bring that up. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I think. Great. Are we good to go? Yeah. Excellent. Right. Welcome everybody in person and online. Um, it's really nice to have people in the uh, in the room. This is, uh, we're starting to get back into the habit. Right? It's a real <laughs> pleasure. So, so, so thanks very much for coming. Um, my name is Mike Collier. I'm in the geography department here, and I'm delighted to be chairing Anka Schwitty's um, lecture in the Sussex Development Lectures this evening. I'm going to have to read out her bio because I can't remember it because it's so good. Um, Anka's Professor of Anthropology and Global Development um, in Global Studies here at Sussex. Um, and co convenes the MA Media Practice for Social Change and Development. She's co-founder and former research director of the Rios Institute, a Silicon Valley-based organization, and has been consulting for the World Bank Institute, the United Nations Global Alliance for ICT, and Development and Red R. Um, and a lot of what she's going to say tonight is going to be coming from her, her book, um, Creative <laughs> Universities Reimagining Education for Global Challenges and Alternative Futures, which leads to the, um, the, the title of tonight's lecture, Reimagining Development Education in an Uncertain World. As a couple of, uh, of announcements. If you're, gonna, if you're on Twitter and you tweet about um, today, please use the hashtag SussexDev. Um, we should have plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. We're going until 6.30. Um, and anybody on Zoom, if you want to use the closed caption facility, it is available. So um, do turn that on. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. I'm actually going to stand up and go over here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, as Mike said, it's so nice um, to see you um, in the room and welcome to everybody on Zoom. Um, really, really happy that you're here. And I want to thank the organizers of the lecture series and especially Mike for inviting me to give this talk and also for your introduction. So how do we reimagine development education in an uncertain world? Today, I want to try and answer this question by proposing a radical rethinking of how we teach students about sustainability as one of the areas uh, where uncertainty manifests itself in ever more pressing ways. Such a rethinking can be approached by introducing students to alternative ways of understanding ecological interdependence and encouraging them to imagine heterodox responses to current ecological challenges. Now, in making these arguments, um, I'm drawing on my new book, um, as Mike said, called Creative Universities, Reimagining Education for Global Challenges and Alternative Futures, which was published late last year by Bristol University Press. And in this book, I develop what I call a critical creative pedagogy. Uh, and you can see kind of a schematic of that over there, which consists of whole person learning, the use of design and arts methods in the classroom, praxis, and critical hope. And what I do, want to do in my talk today is to explore the application of this pedagogy to development education with a focus on ecological sustainability. And what makes this book particularly relevant for this talk is that the research for, for it actually took place here at the University of Sussex over in the Department of International Development in the School of Global Studies, where we have both um, undergraduate and postgraduate teaching in international development. And for a period of three years, I uh, conducted this research uh, consisting of um, semi-structured interviews with staff and students, countless um, informal conversations and interactions around teaching and learning. I did a systematic review of the teaching materials in the department. I did observations in my colleagues' classrooms and also used my own modules as kind of an experimental space. And I teach a third year specialist module on urban futures and an MA level module in activism for social change and development. 
In teaching these modules, I follow Bell Hooks' call for teaching that enables transgressions, a movement against and beyond boundaries. For me, teaching students to transgress, to go beyond the limits of what is normative and acceptable, implies questioning disciplinary, institutional, and social boundaries. The aim of transgressive teaching is to encourage students to trespass into imagined alternatives that destabilize personal certainties, question ac academic orthodoxies, and challenge the social status quo. Building on Hooks' observation that the classroom remains the most ra radical space in the academy, and I, I firmly believe that, I consider the potential for teaching spaces to become creative locations for envisioning radical possibilities within the reactionary institutions that universities are, and that's a term by Boaventura de Sousa Santos. This also entails a personal transformation into becoming an academic subject of possibility who has, the con as, who has a constitutive role in the world that exists and power to bring new worlds into being. And that's a quote by J.K. Gibson Graham um, and their work on diverse economies, uh, but also much more broader on the possibility of bringing alternatives into being within the academy and nurturing these um, has been another really big influence on my own work. So I will begin my, uh, my talk by decentering sustainable development and education for sustainable, sustainable development as the normative state of the art in development education focusing on sustainability, often by the detour of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. I will then present several alternative approaches to thinking about ecological crisis, complexity, and interdependency, and how students can learn from them in critical creative ways. And a particular example I'm gonna look at in more detail is the use of serious games to teach students about climate change related uncertainty. I will finish with a discussion of the importance of critical hope for reimagining development and broader university education in uncertain times. So let's start by decentering sustainable development. As argued by Arch and Waltz, issues like human triggered climate change make painfully clear that the present major environmental, social, financial, economic, and ecological disruptions both acute and chronic, are interconnected and characterized by high levels of uncertainty and complexity. We live in a systemic world characterized by multiple causation, interactions, complex feedback loops, and inevitable uncertainty and unpredictability. Importantly, Waltz continues that old mechanisms, coordination points, problem-solving strategies, modes of scientific inquiry, and forms of teaching and learning seem inadequate in addressing the present global sustainability challenge. So I want to start by asking, what is the current conventional way of teaching students about the state of the world, especially in relation to ecological sustainability? And one of the concepts that clearly dominates here is sustainable development. So the, the general notion of sustainable development has actually um, quite a long history, but its application to environmental issues um, started in the 1960s and then really came to prominence following the first ever Earth Day in the US in 1970. Now that uh, event, interestingly enough, was actually conceived as a university teach-in inspired by anti-Vietnam War protests. But in the end, it involved millions of, um, of Americans whose environmental consciousness had been raised by the publication of, uh, publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962, and then the iconic Earth Rise picture that was taken by Apollo 8 astronauts six years later. Another milestone was the publication of Limits to Growth, a report written in 1972 by a group of systems thinkers who used computer simulations to model exponential growth within a finite supply of resources. They concluded that Earth's limits to growth would be reached within the next 100 years if growth continued on its current trajectory. The report and its proposed zero growth model started a serious debate about whether continued economic growth is possible or desirable, as well as a discussion about other ways forward. The most prominent of these has arguably been sustainable development, a term that emerged from the, uh, the work of the World Commission on Environment and Development, which was an international group of scientific, economic, and political experts that was convened on, be on behalf of the UN by former Norwegian Prime Minister Krohal and Brundtland. The Commission's members were tasked with identifying long-term environmental strategies 
that would also ensure human needs and interests being met. And the result, as probably most of us know, was the 1987 report, Our Common Future, or better known as the Prundtland Report, which famously defined sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, even though the concept has become so commonplace as to qualify as another development or even popular buzzword, it actually has severe shortcomings when applied to ecological sustainability. Without clearly spelling out whose development and needs were to be considered and how these were to be determined, the Prundtland report was a compromise between two formerly antagonistic ideas. On the one hand, you had conservation as the protection of natural resources. And on the other hand, you had economic development as their exploitation. And um, specifically, environmental protection was now subsumed under economic growth, which was legitimized and reaffirmed as necessary to the solution of environmental problems via the detour of poverty alleviation in developing countries. This primacy of economic growth was reinforced at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, which promoted the idea of sustained, inclusive, and equitable economic growth. The rise of the green economy and environmental economics operationalized the belief that economic growth and environmental sustainability are compatible, made possible by scientific and technological progress, bringing about improvements in efficiency, productivity, and pollution control. Together with voluntary business actions, free trade regimes, and market mechanisms, this reliance on science and technology has become a central focus of mainstream sustainable development interventions. And you have a whole range of concepts, you know, natural capital, um, environmental resource management, species banking, biodiversity, derivatives, carbon trading, all of these concepts and these associated practices are showing that market interventions have become the preferred way uh, the preferred solution to environmental problems and that nature is subordinated to human needs. As many critics have shown, the assumed compatibility between economic growth and environmental sustainability is a fallacy and the proposed ways to achieve it are actually exacerbating ecological crisis. Now, sustainable development also led to the emergence of education for sustainable development, often referred to by its acronym of ESD, which builds on earlier nature studies as well as conservation and environmental education. And going back to the Rio Earth Summit, there were calls for higher education institutions to review their curricula and strengthen studies in sustainable development economics, again showing the focus on economic issues. Now, in the following decades, education. Um, for sustainable development was consolidated under the auspices of UNESCO, which um, defined it as a vision of education that seeks to balance human and economic well being with cultural tradition and respect for the Earth's natural resources. And you can read the rest of this rather long definition on the slide here. And within this particular educational vision, universities are clearly seen to occupy a central role by you know, producing the research that will then inform uh, new interventions by shaping policy, but also by educating future um, leaders and citizens. In response to this vision and clearly driven by student interest, ESD has become part of the global higher education landscape. Universities the world over, including here at Sussex, are developing sustainability-focused teaching and research programs, are adjusting campus operations around environmental management directives and are engaging with communities on sustainability issues. And we also now have a global ranking when in 2018, the Times Higher Education introduced its um, global impact ranking of university's performance linked to the sustainable development goals. Um, similar to sustainable development, ESD has also not been without criticism. Focusing on its market-driven nature, the sidelining of ethical and moral questions, and its purportedly global character. But what I just want to say here at this point is that it shouldn't be surprising that um, education for sustainable, sustainable development reproduces the same limitations and contradictions of sustainable development, mainly by a focus on developing competencies that help students better participate in the green economy. Now, but instead of you know, continuing to talk about these limitations and contradictions, which could easily take up the rest of this lecture, I actually now want to kind of 
change tag and look at some of the alternatives um, and how these can be introduced to students. So um, to start off with, many activists and academic critics are arguing for a shift from the anthropocentrism inherent in sustainable development. And this is, you can see here, a couple of um, uh, illustrations that puts human needs either at the center or at the top of ecological considerations to ecocentrism, which recognizes that nature and non-human species have intrinsic value independent from their utility for human beings. Ecocentrism emerged in the 1950s from Aldo Leopold's land ethic, which redefined human beings as symbiotically living in an interdependent community that also includes soil, water, plants, and animals. And these ideas were further developed in the early 1970s by a Norwegian philosopher, Arne Ness, who contrasted a shallow ecology, fighting pollution and resource depletion in the service of human development, with what he called a deep ecology, built around the radical interrelationship of all systems of life. Deep ecology encompasses respect for the integrity for the environment, a moral obligation to accord nature and ecosystems an independent place in ethical reflections, and a duty to protect the environment through consistent attitudes, policies, and actions, including in education. And Ness's ideas have influenced many contemporary ecocentric approaches, for example, those that argue for the rights of nature or of animal species. Another alternative approach, uh, approach that many of you are probably familiar with is degrowth, which argues for the kind of abandoning um, uh, growth as kind of an economic, social, and political objective. As Sarah Amsler has argued, in these approaches, sustainability is seen not as a technical problem of rationalizing the distribution and use of resources, but as a normative position, which is accomplished through political and cultural struggles to assert such values. So there is a conscious shift from science and technology and markets onto kind of ethical and political grounds. Now to signal this shift, I actually like to use the term sustainability, which is a, a term I, I borrow from Tony Fry, who is a design scholar for whom this hyphen makes kind of quite visible and explicit the, um, the uh, human's responsibility to sustain life in its interdependent wholeness. So it is our ability to sustain that is at stake here. Coming back to development, to development education, one implication is the need for an explicit values-based pedagogy. This could be based on principles of deep ecology and include ecofeminist understandings of the role of patriarchy and androcentrism in the construction of hierarchical binaries, as we see between men, women, culture, nature, mind, body, or reason, emotions. Ecofeminists argue for transcending these binaries in the search for an inclusive and relational ethic based on the values of care and compassion, while at the same time arguing against, and I think that's really important, arguing against any essentialist identifications of women with either nature or with care. This pedagogy could also include political and social ecology, which interrogates the role of capitalism in the, in the human exploitation of nature shows the historical and ongoing unequal distribution of environmental resources and impacts, and proposes the values of solidarity and respect. Importantly, this values-based pedagogy rejects authoritarian and elitist approaches that sideline the needs of especially marginalized people in a quest for natural purity. Such values-based education can be found in eco-pedagogies and eco-literacies, which are an extension of critical pedagogy to environmental issues. Informed by the popular education of Paolo Freire, ecopedagogies encompass both formal education and activist practices to develop students' planetary consciousness through programs that help them interrogate the intersection of social, political, economic, and environmental systems. They also focus, uh, they also incorporate praxis as the Freirean cycle of action informed by theory, by reflection, and debate to connect learning to public discourse and to social movements. This often involves place-based teaching that can foster a deep immersive relationship with nature and a sense uh, of grounding and stewardship. And we actually have a really, um, really nice example of this here on campus. It's a module called the Forest Food Garden, which is uh, run by 
John Perry, Perpetua Kirby, and Daphne Lambert at the School of Education and Social Work, where students literally plant a garden in the north end of campus, uh, if you ever want to go and visit it. And Perpetua and her colleague, Rebecca Webb, will actually be giving the Sussex Development Lecture in April, where they will focus on what embracing uncertainty means for rethinking schooling experience for younger pupils. So that's also something to look forward to. Decolonial and indigenous scholars have argued that such place-based education must include attention to how human relations to land have been shaped by historical and ongoing effects of colonialism with their resulting violence, extraction, and dispossession. Indigenous cosmologies to, to which land is often central shape distinct practices of learning from the land and incorporate environmental, physical, intellectual, and spiritual um, dimensions into collective visions. And these collective visions often clash with dominant narratives of progress and development. And that raises the really important political questions of whose environmental futures are actually desirable. Indigenous cosmologies give rise to radical well being notions that break with anthropocentric and capitalist centric logics. They also inform struggles against large scale extractivist and other environmentally damaging projects. These perspectives are part of a larger movement towards global South practices of sustainability education, which take into account the effects of historical resource flows and loss of commons, as well as contemporary issues of climate colonialism and environmental justice. As argued by Hela Lotsi-Sitka, who is a leading South African educator, these practices embrace a commitment to generativity and emergence and to open process dialogical yet critical aspirational and emancipatory principles for education and learning. They are open to pluriversal ways of relating to other humans uh, as well as to plants and animals, and thereby work against the marginalization of subaltern knowledges and non-Western epistemologies. Mm. And one of these epistemologies um, is the South American concept of Buen Vivir, which is often translated as good living or living well. And I want to just talk a little bit about this because in addition to Sussex, I did research for the Creative Universities Project at a number of Bolivian universities. And while I was in La Paz, I had several conversations with colleagues there about the uh, the indigenous and the national um, Bolivian um, politics around Bron Rivier. And these politics are complex and they are contested. And teaching students uh, about them can complicate simplistic and romanticized notions of alternative ideas and actors, while also showing the radical potency they hold. So really briefly, um, Bon Rivier emerged at the turn of the 20th century amongst uh, various indigenous peoples in Latin, in Latin America as a pluriversal alternative to Western anthropocentric worldviews. It centers on living in harmony with oneself, society, and nature, on pluriculturalism, and on the inseparability of all elements of life. As a deeply place-based notion linked to specific territories as the material and spiritual basis for life, Buen Vivir is enacted within socio-ecological communities that closely interlink human and other than human beings. It is a manifestation of the pluriverse as a world where many worlds fit in the world of the Zapatistas, as you can see here, and is shaped by epistemic and ontological multiplicity that includes a relational conception of the world and deeply experiential ways of knowing it. And as Arturo Escobar has argued so eloquently in his recent work, Buen Vivir's key idea of autonomy and communality are contributing to designing new forms of life in response to current crisis that cannot be addressed with conventional practices. Now, Buen Vivir is also a very dynamic and an open concept that does not reject technological advances or contributions from other cultures. And for this reason, it actually has kind of um, evolved from its indigenous origins to become a kind of an umbrella term that is connecting and amplifying a number of uh, critical traditions that are searching for alternatives to development. Now, this broader uptake of Bon Vivier again has a quite a complex and contested genealogy forged by diverse actors in the context of broader political shifts in, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, and in Latin America, um, as well as global crises and social movement responses. This international embrace of Bon Vivier has led to, to criticism that the in indigenous creators of the concept's diverse worldviews 
have been sidelined and once again invisibilized as political actors. This is an example of what Ramon Crossfogel calls epistemic extractivism, where indigenous concepts are taken out of the contexts where they were produced in order to depoliticize and resignify them from Western centric logics. In the process, these critics argue, Bon Rivier has been tamed and institutionalized and actually lost its radical potential. So teaching students about Bon Rivier can show them the complex articulations of local creations with national, regional, and international actors, events, and discourses, which leads to tensions and appropriations and resistances. Resulting class discussions about knowledge creation, amplification, and extraction can nuance idealistic assumptions about alternative visions and can deconstruct romanticized views of indigenous peoples as timeless ecological guardians. A critical exploration on the concept must also include, besides, you know, there's a really, really large um, academic, um, English academic literature on one review now, but it also must include uh, writings by Bolivian, uh, Ecuadorian, other Latin American scholars. It must include policy texts, and it must also include um, um, indigenous declarations. For example, here is the Cochabamba People's, Agree uh, People's Agreement. Uh, and this plurality is really important to bring into the classroom to make sure that the variety of, of stakeholders that are involved in developing the concepts uh, is being heard. But I would say there's also more creative ways in which students can be taught about um, Bon Rivier. For example, by students reading um, indigenous documents, such as this Cochabamba People's Agreement, which came out of a convention that was held in the Bolivian town of Cochabamba after the Copenhagen um, climate change meetings. So reading kind of indigenous documents against comparable uh, UN documents, and then writing responses to those, and then designing and enacting um, a, a meeting where those documents could be discussed and debated. So this could include students imagining the meeting's locations, scripting its format, rituals, and performances, as well as role-playing the various actors that would come together. And such a learning activity, it wouldn't be based on kind of fantasy or just making things up, but it would be based on really grounded studies, including of recent events such as COP26, right? In Glasgow, seems a long time ago already, but where kind of the politics of representation and policy making were really, really um, um, obvious, including the role of indigenous peoples in that process. So this kind of learning would not only sharpen students' critical awareness of the complexities of formulating and enacting alternative visions within local and global contexts, but would also allow them to explore these dynamics in creative ways that can generate multidimensional insights into the difficult social and political lives of alternative visions. And as this kind of creative teaching activity shows, for me, creativity is actually a crucial part of sustainability education because we cannot create what we cannot imagine first. Creativity and imagination are necessary to work towards an ecological future that is drastically different from the current status, which is deeply implicated in ecological crisis. Here, Eliza Sandri argues that certainty is lethal to two of our most redeeming and humane qualities, imagination and empathy. If the right answers are there to be learned by students, then there is no space for being wrong, experimenting, imagining alternatives, or seeing issues from multiple perspectives and frameworks. By contrast, getting students grapple with really hard to answer questions instills a capacity to embrace ambiguity and uncertainty. Creative modes of thinking can also help students to unlearn unsustainability. And that's um, a term by Arjun Waltz um, which refers to the process of letting go of cherished assumptions and certainties that can be really fundamental to students' understanding of, of progress and development, of the role and value of nature, but also of their own kind of personal and professional and political entanglements, entanglements in this really complex ensemble. Now, um, I realize from my own experiences that this kind of unlearning can be deeply unsettling to students especially to students who come to university expecting it, learning to be kind of a transmission of knowledge about the, the right ways in which development works, uh, works in the world. And I will speak a little bit more about this later. But instead, what um, uh, kind of a reimagined development education needs um, 
is an understanding um, ecological crisis that is about acknowledging uncertainty and requires divergent thinking, looking at things from multiple and different perspectives and making new connections across unrelated areas. In the words of Ken Robinson, this pedagogical creativity entails the ability to leap out of familiar habits into new idea spaces. And I think teaching should very much encourage that. Importantly, this also includes educators, students and their educators developing a basic understanding of systems and complexity thinking, which is something I'm briefly gonna look at now. As the quote by Arjun Waltz, with which, with which I opened my talk shows, conventional ways of teaching students about current challenges are ill-equipping them to understand these challenges and to tackle them. Students are also exposed to overwhelming amounts of information, uh, from, uh, of overwhelming amounts of sometimes contradictory information from diverse sources. They face persistent questions about ecological impacts and their trade-offs. They don't have any easy answers, but really kind of enormous implications, including for students' own practices. And they are confronted with the undeniable evidence of the increasing destruction brought by human activity on Earth. All of these are contributing to a loss of confidence in established interventions. In the words of Boaventura de Sousa Santos, we are facing modern problems for which there are no longer modern solutions. And modern here refers to the reductionist and mechanistic worldview stemming from the Cartesian science, which is beginning to be replaced with holistic, ecological understandings of the world that takes its systematic, systemic and complex nature seriously. Um, there are a number of academic fields that deal with that complexity, right? We have living systems theory, complex system science, nonlinear dynamics, chaos theory, all of these are trying to grapple with this complex world. And in spite of the differences amongst these fields, um, there's um, a set of core elements that they all um, agree on that characterize complex systems. They include interdependence, self-organization, emergence, and nonlinearity. And I've just put up the definitions of those terms on the slide here. Authors such as Donella Meadows and Friedrich Capra have written accessible introductions to complex system thinking that can be used for, as primers for students' learning. And actually not only for students' learning, but also for educators' learning, because that was certainly the case with me when I first um, kind of started thinking about that. I didn't have any knowledge. So often it has to start with educating the educator or teaching the teacher about complex systems thinking to then being able to introduce that into the classroom. Key concepts include feedback loops, mental models, and, and paradigms, which Meadow, Meadows defines as the great, big, unstated assumptions that constitute society's deepest set of beliefs about how the world works. Shifting these paradigms is not easy, but can provide important leverage points, which is another key concept, um, where small changes can bring about systems-level transformations. Introducing students to the basics of complex systems thinking calls for a number of shifts in our teaching. And to outline these shifts, I um, again um, draw on Friedrich Capra's work. So the first shift here, from objects to relationships, means studying networks, webs, and their interrelationships rather than discrete entities. The latter are too often the focus of learning because parts are the most visible system elements, while their interconnections are harder to detect. Shifting from objects to relationships directs students' attention to interdependencies, cooperation, and conservation. A second shift from contents to patterns includes moving from measuring matter to mapping form. This foregrounds visual methods that can develop students' abilities to recognize and represent patterns, which make overall systems visible. Patterns also reveal long-term cycles and ecosystems that have renewed themselves for million of, millions of years providing important lessons for sustainability by cautioning against single focus, short-term solutionism. The third shift from linearity to non-linearity is one of the most challenging because of the prevailing linear worldview that when something works, more of the same will always be better. Now, this is not the case for non-linear systems where the outcomes of change cannot be predicted or controlled and can lead to irreversible tipping points. The final shifts from parts to whole help students see living systems as integrated wholes, 
Under the Newtonian mechanistic paradigm, complex systems are deconstructed to analyze the properties of their parts without then re uh, reconsidering the whole. In the holistic paradigm, parts can only be understood within the context of the larger whole, which also enables students to better see connections and to recognize sustainability as the property of an entire network. These four shifts are best achieved through transdisciplinary teaching, resulting in cross-fertilization and inter um, integra integrative teaching, adopting an and also rather than an either or perspective also contrib contributes to adaptive learning. And together these shifts can result in what Archon was called Gestalt switching, which comes from this uh, German word Gestalt, which means organic form. And it involves students kind of moving back and forth across multiple mindsets and actually quite similar to uh, the domain bridging that is an integral part of creative thinking. Such bridging helps students to cope with the uncertainty that results from the increasing recognition that more knowledge and information lead to more rather than less uncertainty. In other words, students have to become comfortable with uncertainty rather than letting it lead to inaction or apathy. And in the kind of 16 plus years that I've been teaching in ID um, in, in the US and New Zealand and now in the UK, I've often come across students who talk about becoming quite cynical or, or disillusioned or hopeless when they first encounter um, critical perspectives, for example, about development, when they learn about their colonial legacies, the ongoing inequalities, the kind of the shortcomings and the failures of international development. That's certainly how we teach development um, over in global studies or when they learn that the work of organizations, you know, who therefore were really benevolent actors, charities or NGOs, we have thought, you know, are kind of um, erasing poverty, saving the poor, when this work can actually have negative consequences. Uh, while this critical um, teaching, critical knowledge is absolutely crucial and students do appreciate it, um, in the conclusion of my talk, I will also talk about uh, the importance of nurturing students' critical hope that can help them move beyond the impasse that this, um, this um, critical questioning can create. But before I do that, I want to look at one particular way in which creative teaching can be used to open up students' understanding of um, uncertainty, in this case related to climate change, and that is the use of serious games. And for this part of my talk, I draw on observations during a third year undergraduate module called Disaster environment and development that is taught by my colleague Dom Neifden uh, to ID and geography students in global studies. Through a series of workshops that kind of run the course of the term, students, they first learn about serious games, they then play them, and they end up designing their own games, working in groups, and having their fellow students play them. So why games and why play? Play involves experimenting, failing, learning by doing, manipulating objects, and immersing students in a subjunctive mode. This involves transgressing the world as it presents itself through playing by different rules and through appropriating objects and situations differently from what they were intended for. Play can be both fun and dangerous, creative and destructive, affirmative and subversive. And it is, it is in this multiplicity that its potential for imagining and creating alternative lies. Games are collaborative, which can foster social learning and reinforces the importance of bringing different groups together. And they can create positive mental energy that can counter environmental pessimism and despair. Especially relevant for this talk are systems games, during which students can inhabit the complexities of climate risk, for example, and then explore and test a range of plausible futures. Students can experience various aspects of ecological and climate systems behavior can playfully understand how these systems function, examine their own assumption and responses to them, and experiment with rule bending and leverage points. Because games operate in compressed time, they, allow for the, they also allow for the exploration of longer range ecological challenges. Um, so an important aspect of DOM's teaching and of complex systems thinking in general is so-called triple loop learning that ask students to be reflective about the very process of learning. Single loop asks, are we doing things right? And double loop asks, are we doing the right things? And then triple loops build in dance and saying, how do we know what the right things are? 
So it's about playing by the rules, changing the rules, and perhaps most importantly, asking who makes the rules. Um, I don't really have time to go into the details observations here of my observations. And this picture is not of dumb students. It's actually of development practitioners playing serious games uh, with the Red Cross Red Crescent, which has a really big section on their website and a big library of serious games if you're interested in learning more about that. But it gives you some idea of what um, playing a serious game looks like. Um, but what I want to do now is just reflect on how these games can be used for development education. So all of the uh, student games that I observed were designed to explore themes of uncertainty, risk, vulnerability, and resilience. They incorporated systems of resource allocation, protection, and spending, short and long-term scenarios, and many different elements of chance, such as dice, online randomizers, and cards. Players often worked with different amounts of physical and financial resources and had to make decisions about what crops, programs, or preventative measures to invest in under uncertain and often unstressful circumstances. It was really, really interesting um, to uh, be in the classroom and observe these games being played. So there was often very kind of loud, aggressive, heavy metal music playing to create a really stressful atmosphere. And players had often very short amount of time, like 30 seconds to make a really important decision about how much and what kind of crops to buy for the next year without knowing what the weather would be like, because that would be kind of decided by, uh, you know, uh, pulling a particular card. Um, so there was kind of short, short amount of time for decision making. And there was often restricted movement. So players would have their wrists uh, tied together or they wouldn't be allowed to touch certain things or they would have to move across the room without touching the floor. So having to use chairs and cooperating. Um, and it was incredible to see both the kind of the creativity that students had been able to put into designing these games, but also see the kind of learning that they were getting out from playing those games. Um, and for me, that was a really good example of this kind of embodied and whole person learning that I'm, uh, that I'm talking about. Interestingly, some groups had managed to incorporate triple loop learning as part of the game by creating opportunities for players to re reflect on and explain their choices. So hypothetical NGO or government representatives would come along and ask them, why did you make this decision? And then the players would have to explain that in, in exchange for getting getting more aid or something like this. So there was an element of reflexivity built into some of the games. Knifton, um, for Knifton, because games are com themselves complex stories <coughs> with many interconnections and feedback loops, they can convey systems complexity and capture things that are not easily taught in more linear ways. Games also create a safe environment in which to challenge or bend rules, to explore different possibilities and to fail without consequences. Knifton encouraged students to be confident in drawing out players' own knowledge instead of providing all the answers, to resist giving too much direction and instead foster, foster open-endedness and flexibility amongst the players, and to be humble in allowing players to question the rules of the game design. All of these are elements of complex systems thinking. And in the book, I include lots and lots of student reflections of these game activities and just want to draw here um, out a few of them that are particularly relevant for complexity and uncertainty. So in one case, uh, the players had designed the game and were kind of playing it and realized that it was just wasn't working as expected and they made a small tweak. And then they realized that that changed the whole game and they had to kind of rethink. So they realized the importance of interconnection within a system there was a really good learning moment, but it was also very frustrating for the players, um, to be honest. Another group talked about their delight when the players of their game challenged one of the decisions in the game design. For the designers, they called it a perfect moment of learning for both the players, because they had discovered something that the designers had not thought of, and they felt comfortable enough to challenge the designers. And the designers themselves, they had... Um, they were comfortable enough um, in accepting the challenge, thinking about it, and ultimately changing that part of the game. So this was a particular example of rules being negotiated and ultimately changed. Another group commented that it is incredibly hard to make something that is both fun and educational. I think as the educator in this room will agree with. It was hard to simplify something as complex as disaster risk reduction, 
where do you draw the boundary of what to include? So this group had come up against the issue of boundaries, which are spaces of potential disruption and creativity. According to Dunella Meadows, we have to invent boundaries for clarity and sanity, but boundaries can also produce problems when we forget that we have artificially created them. While playing the games, students remained aware of their simplifications and of how far removed their classroom experiences were from real situations of disaster and the people experiencing them. And that was the result of both critical teaching that they had um, you know, in their program, in their course beforehand, but also the teaching that went alongside the game design. And that allowed them to realize the strong limitations of models. However, students also said that immersion increases empathy as they reflected on what it felt like to be in stressful, time-limited or under-resourced situations. Experiencing the constraints resulting from operating in situations of uncertainty, from having limited resources or possibilities, and from having to work with others were seen as valuable experiential learning opportunities. These opportunities also made students understand that in situations of uncertainty, whilst the odds are slim, possibility always exists. And that's how one of the students put it. This contributed to a sense of hope that was expressed by several students. And this now brings me to the conclusion of my talk in which I want to reflect on the importance of critical hope for reimagining development education in uncertain times. As researchers such as Maria Ojala have shown, hope is an emotion that is of particular importance to sustainability education. As she writes, hope is a positive emotion and an existential must that needs to be cultivated by showing students that another way of being is possible, by encouraging trustful relationships and by giving young people the opportunity to concretely work together for change. However, such hope needs to be critical so as not to result in unrealistic optimism or wishful thinking, in a denial of the seriousness of ecological challenges or in students disengaging from them. Critical hope is one of the four strands of my critical creative pedagogy. And in this talk, I have shown how this hope can be nurtured through whole person learning, which can take place outside the classroom, like in the, you know, the forest food garden module, or through the embodied learning that we saw in the serious games. Critical hope can also be nurtured through using design and arts methods in the class. And again, the creativity that the students showed in designing these games is a really good example of that. Another important element is praxis in the Frarian sense of practice informed by theory, reflection and dialogue, where theoretical learning is joined by action in the world, which in turn is critically interrogated at all times. This means that critical hope is active in engaging with complex challenges, reparative in addressing past injustices and forward-looking in imagining and enacting alternative responses to these challenges. Now, I do realize that we live in really bleak times and that I think we only have to turn on the news or wherever we get our, our news from um, to, uh, to think that hope right now might be misguided or naive. I know that hope has become commodified and sloganized often beyond any meaningful content. And I know that for some, in the words of Lake Ingress, hopelessness is what the contemporary ethos demands as we attend to the serious business of trying to adapt to circumstances that are increasingly alienating and oppressive. And I personally think right now it's hard not to agree with these statements. Um, and yet, I also believe that we have to hold on to critical hope. So I want to finish with a quote by Paolo Freire which I think provides a particularly poignant end to my talk on reimagining education for ecological sustainability. In Pedagogy of Hope, Freire writes, my hope is necessary, but it is not enough. Alone, it does not win. But without it, my struggle will be weak and wobbly. We need critical hope the way fish needs unpolluted water. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Anka. That was absolutely fascinating. A really broad, <laughs> authoritative, theoretical overview 
to start with and then finishing up with these range of really practical examples about how to do it. And it uh, I certainly find this really inspiring. And since the book has come out, it's, it's pushed me to think in new ways about how to teach things and how not to be completely bleak with students because I think the point that you're ending on is really, really fundamental. And I've, uh, yeah, I've learned a lot, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and we have a large audience online and, and a substantial audience here. So um, I'll hand it over to, if you're online, then please um, type a question um, into, the, uh, into the chat if you would like to ask one. I'm watching the chat now, so I can, uh, I can read it out. And uh, would anybody in the room like to come up to the, uh, the microphone here? Lindsay, great, thanks. I think that will help people in, in Zoom. Um, follow so uh, they do come up yeah thanks Andrew. it's absolutely fascinating i agree and i'm now wanting to read everything from the book um i guess what i'm really interested because you know the examples like particularly you're looking at um, systems thinking and reflective theory you are also applying that to sustainability environmental sort of justice issues i guess i'm interested in the extent to which and how you think they can be that kind of thinking can be applied to social issues as well. Uh, you know, I work on gender violence. That's a very complex issue, you know, in human systems. And I'm just really interested in that and extent to which, how and how and whether that can be applied, do you think, to this kind of work? Let's take them one at a time. Thank you, Lindsay. And that's, um, I think it's a, a really good question that I've kind of grappled with in my own teaching. I don't have the answer for, for gender-focused teaching, but I can give you an example from my Urban Futures module where um, we have a week on, on infrastructures and kind of the visibility of um, infrastructures to politics around um, accessible and, and equal infrastructures. And students um, actually walk across Sussex campus um, uh, uh, we turn kind of campus into a mini city for that particular week and they have a map and they map a particular infrastructure that they have researched before and that uh, then I also ask them to pay attention to how those human-made infrastructures are embedded in the kind of the natural landscape around them, how they are interacting with potential users and they can ask people as they see them but also with the environment and then they come back in the classroom and um, prepare presentations, also thinking how they, um, you know, how they could be made more sustainability. And then in the end, we come together and create kind of a, um, a master map or something and really try and capture something of the, the complexity of putting it all together into kind of a whole that would integrate the different infrastructures, but also look at because they all go to different parts of campus. So I have to say, I'm actually just at the very beginning of the journey and each year as I get more feedback from students, as I read more, this particular activity and a number of my teaching activities evolves. So I don't have, you know, the, the complete answer to this question. I think it's actually a real gradual pro pro process of experimenting, but thinking of, of larger holds, thinking of kind of interrelationships and getting students to, to, to think of those connections and working together and making the connections is one of the ways that I've kind of started to approach it. So in my case, which focus on, on, on urban issues. Thank you. Any other questions in the room or online? Following on from that, I mean, I've got lots of questions in store, obviously, but, um, but I'll, I'll use one of my first <laughs> Um One of the things that, that always um, strikes me about what I know of your teaching is that you put a lot of effort into getting students out of the classroom, which I don't for one, and I think a lot of us are in that situation, but can you say something about the value of changing those sorts of contexts of teaching? I mean, what do the, the, the one example that you were using there is one that I've heard before, and it's such a good, good idea, just getting students walking around campus. Even. Yeah. How do students respond to that sort of situation? And how does that, that figure in this sort of broader pedagogical approach? Yeah, so I, the campus exercise I frame as a walking seminar, and there is quite a bit of literature around the pedagogies of that. So the importance of structure, so students don't just wander off and they have they have like they have their map their route beforehand they have a sheet of questions they have to answer to make sure that you know they kind of stay on track 
But students actually talk about, um, in this case, campus, which is something they have been on for two years. I mean, not with COVID or in pre-COVID times, and I think coming back to that, they've always taken for granted and never really thought about as a, um, a, a teaching space or a space in which they can learn outside the classroom. So there's sometimes these aha moments of, you know, becoming quite consciousness. So a really good example is um, uh, when they talk about water infrastructures and they look at the, uh, um, for example, the residencies and are realizing the, the difference between the older residencies where there is a limited um, water access and people have to change showers and then the newer residencies, which are obviously more expensive, but um, there is unlimited water access. And so getting them to think about kind of inequalities around that is, is quite interesting. Another thing I do in this module is use Brighton as an example. And we have activities in Brighton. And I've also now just changed the module to incorporate more of a, an actually an element in Brighton where students have to go and do some research in Brighton. Because again, using a space that students know quite well, because in third year, most students will have lived in Brighton for you know at least a year or so. And again, making them aware of their own practices as Brighton residents, their own tracing their own interactions and kind of routes through the city. And then on the basis of that, thinking of how the city could be reimagined, again, is something that, that works really well and really resonates with students. So in my out of the classroom learning, I always use spaces that students are familiar with mm -hmm. to get that element of experiential learning and to also validate their own knowledge about situations. For me, that's that's a really important element and that I think um, has worked quite well so far. Great, thank you. But, uh, oh, there's a couple more comments. Um, go ahead, Maya, and then I'll turn to... Yes. Sorry to be uh, dictatorial about it. Thanks, Uncle, that was really fascinating really interesting and it's made me think about a lot of sort of issues and one was one was just actually struggling to understand how what might be different what one might do differently in sort of you know the kind of anthropology teaching that I do especially medical anthropology teaching which is about you know also all this about uncertainties and and multiple paradigms and you know different kinds of knowledge systems and the question I actually had for you was about translation, which is, you know, how, how as a, say, a moderator or facilitator, you, you enable the students to learn, firstly, by providing them some kind of embodied experience yeah. where they have, they gain this empathy, but then how does that translate into the actual question that you are, you know, the issue about, at, in a particular context or with a particular, you know, how does how does that translation take place? Do you employ certain modes of translation there that uh, enable them to, you know, move from that individual embodied experience to really understanding the 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 issue? The at learning, state, yeah, as it were. yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there are kind of modes of translations. I ask an awful lot of questions. I always, always ask questions. And I think one of the things that your, um, your, your question made me think of when, when, the, when the students were playing the serious games um, in terms of how they were really, and also when I, when I kind of did interviews and the feedback on the students, the real awareness that what I experience in when I play these games in the classroom, you know, I might be stressed out and I might have my instincts kicking in. That doesn't mean that people in those real situations of disaster are experiencing that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and kind of drawing that out through questions to connecting to kind of literature, like um, Caroline Padwell is somebody who talks about the importance of maintaining that distance, mm -hmm. um, but really, um, really getting to students to think what their own experiences mean, mean uh, for themselves, but also the, the challenges of translating that to apply that to other contexts. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, I think one, one, of, one, of the, one of the other things I also um, always insist on is, is research, research. As you know, I'm an anthropologist, mm -hmm. you know, my background, so I always, for me, the importance of research, 
bring a lot of ethnographies into my classes to give students uh, that really rich, rich context of an urban futures. And um, in activism, for example, if I can just give uh, another example, um, my students are um, now just beginning their campaign work because in the activism module, they're actually designing their own um, campaigns on topics that they choose. And they've just picked their topics, really interesting topics. Unfortunately, the campaigns remain hypothetical because they can't be implemented simply because of, you know, in the summer they do their dissertation work. But I always say this is real in the sense of you do real research. So whatever topic you choose, you have to research it, you have to get the facts. So to avoid that sometimes some of these uh, exercises could really become quite, you know, disconnected and just kind of unrealistic and students making things up and students sometimes they struggle with this. They're saying, oh, I don't know what has to be realistic, what, what can be hypothetical. And there's, there's a balance. I, and I often work that out in conversation with students. So, so asking questions, giving lots of guidance, that's the other thing. These, these creative activities, they might seem really um, unstructured and open-ended, but they actually need lots and lots of instructions and quite a bit of planning to make sure that, you know, within a three-hour workshop, you actually get to the end of it. And you have, uh, for example, a, a debrief. It's always really important to have at the end, bring everybody together and reflect on what they have learned and how they have learned it. And I, I always ask the question, what did you learn from this activity that you wouldn't have learned just from reading an article? That's usually my final question. And it often brings out quite interesting answers because our students are so used to reading and discussing and critiquing articles. So shifting from that, and in my book, I quote students saying, oh, you know, building, building, building houses out of blocks and, and Play-Dohs. Um, that was really hard because our brains are not trained to do that anymore. So also providing a space for where students feel comfortable doing that, where they are kind of um, invited, but also acknowledging, you know, some of you are, might not be really comfortable with that. So kind of in terms of that, that experimental space, setting this up, you know, bringing lots of stuff into the classroom. So there are, there are all kinds of things that, that, that can be done to make sure that it's, it's a good learning experience, but that that learning does take place. I don't know if that answers your question. I think mean, I just threw a whole bunch of stuff at you, um, but that's some of the strategies that I use in my teaching. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. We've got quite a few questions online now. So I'm gonna take a couple from line line and then come back to the room. Um, Mag Liddy says, thanks for your talk, Anka. Can you explain further about how you engage students with the complexity of Buen Vivir? Yes, so um, Buen Vivir, is, um, I'm, so a couple of reasons why I actually included in the book, I'm, I'm a trained Latin Americanist and I have been doing research in the region for a number of years. And it, the reason why I chose Bolivia as one of the sites was because I know that it was one of the sites sites where Bon Vivir first originated and is still really uh, discussed and contested. And in terms of the complexities, Bon Vivir um, can sometimes be assumed to be kind of, you know, an indigenous alternative vision of environment. And it is based on this harmonious relationship to nature and, and, and indigenous peoples being these, you know, I call them the assumption that they are these timeless ecologic guardians and have this responsibility to be in nature and, 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 to, and to guard it, and which I think personally denies indigenous people's kind of agency and the ability to change. So on the one hand, um, by showing how Bon Vivir has originated, but then has also been taken up and, and as critics say, appropriated by non-indigenous academics, by Northern academics, and has become this, this, this um, kind of global discourse, I think students can learn about you know, the lives that alternative visions can, can take on, where, where often, where in this case, I think um, indigenous creators have lost some control over it and that has been, ha has been critiqued. But also understanding, um, you know, how do they become embedded in global development discourses? Because when we talk about um, alternative visions, um, I think some of them lend themselves to this broader uptake. And I think Bon Vivir is definitely, definitely one of those that a lot of people have uh, latched on. And, and um, Eduardo Guianes is one of the ones who's really built it as, as this umbrella term. 
So understanding how that happens, understanding that these processes are not agreed by everybody, that there is disagreement, that there is resistance. I didn't even talk about Bolivia itself. I mean, if I have a little bit of time, I can just explain again. So it was um, uh, in Bolivian indigenous peoples who were part of formulating this and then uh, made it part of the political discourse when Eva Morales first came to power in 2006, when he became the, uh, Bolivia's first indigenous president. Bon Vivier became a really explicit part of governmental policy. It focused on kind of decolonization and the rights of nature and, and Pachamama and all of that. Um, so he really embraced the discourse of, uh, of, um, of Bon Vivier as part of his policies talked about environmental justice and, and you know, the rights of indigenous peoples and of nature. But then on the other hand, he was, or his party has been pursuing this really large extractivist projects, dispossessing indigenous peoples. So there's a real gap between rhetoric and practice, which I think is another one of these contestations. And in, in understanding how this plays out in Bolivia is a really good example to explain students simply that we can't just assume that alternatives are these you know, these spaces where everybody agrees, where there's harmony, where there is um, kind of a feel good, but that these themselves are often contested and contradictory, which doesn't mean they're invalid. It doesn't mean they, they can have real potency, but there's always a politics around any kind of knowledge system. And um, just from my own knowledge of Bon Vivier, I know it's, it's a really good example to, to show that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I hope that answers your question, Max. I think that was a very detailed response. Um, Peter Taylor says, thank you, Anka, very inspiring. Some years ago at IDS, we had an online community called Learning and Teaching for Transformation, where many educational practitioners shared examples of how they used creative methods and approaches. One of the biggest challenges discussed was a feeling of lack of support from their institution. They often felt they were perceived as out there and a bit disruptive, which I guess is the point, says Peter. Um, what advice would you give to educators who want to get creative but feel nervous about negative reactions that they might receive from their institutions or students? Yeah, so that's I think question, it's, it's, it's a really good one. I think I've talked a little bit about um, negative reactions from students. So really uh, explaining why you're doing what you're doing, acknowledging that there can be discomfort and saying it's okay, but creating these kind of invitational spaces now with colleagues, it's interesting. I'm incredibly lucky to be in a department in international development and also having to some extent in anthropology where, um, where people are pretty much on the same page in terms of this kind of teaching. And uh, I have to say, <laughs> I actually did a lot of this research for my book when I was head of department and I actually participated in hiring quite a few of the people. And that was part of what we looked for in the interviews. And it's resulted in, in a, a department that is really embracing, you know, critical hope. We talk about critical hope as being as at, at, at the heart of what we do and people being really creative in their classes, which has allowed me to, to do the research and, and write this book. Um, I also know kind of, you know, skepticism by other people who might not understand this kind of teaching. I have had reactions to mm, bringing this in the classroom, you know, what's the point? I just, I just do my own thing because I believe it's important. Um, I've had a lot of, I think within the school, a lot of support from the people in the school, kind of DTL. It's, I think a lot of it is also kind of, you know, flying under the, the radar screen. And, and I'm, I mean, we are lucky. I don't know how it is in IDS, but in global, at least in our own modules, we have an, a lot of freedom in how we design and run our modules as long as they, you know, um, um, fulfill the learning objectives and, and teach the kind of the, the, um, the, the required curriculum. But around that, we have a lot of freedom. And I think using that freedom and, and finding other people who are interested in that, um, learning from them and also kind of supporting each other, that has been my, um, my strategy. And when I have encountered negative criticisms, I try and engage, I try to explain why I do what I do, um, but ultimately I'm not asking people, and I make this really clear in my book, 
I'm not I'm imposing that on anybody. I'm saying this is the only way to teach or you have to teach this way. The book is really written as an invitation for people to try this stuff out and see if it works for them. Um, so I realized that some people have different teaching styles. And I think it's, you know, the, the, the you know, reading and discussing articles and having those more standard seminar discussion is really important. And what I'm talking about is really in addition to that, it's not meant to replace that. So with that kind, I guess, live in that live attitude, it's, it's worked for me so far. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Peter. Let's have one more from online and then we'll come back to the, uh, to the room. Um, Susan Angoy says, how do you address the tensions between the global north and south on climate change, CO2 emissions, for example, in context of imperative for economic development in the south? An example of this is the recent oil and gas field discovery offshore in Guyana, the largest potential source in South America. The climate change argument is that no further oil should be removed from the earth, yet the funds from this exploitation have been earmarked for essential development and basic infrastructure of Guyana. How do you address these kinds of tensions in an educational context? These students may be future policymakers and politicians in both the North and South. That's one of a number of really thorny issues that are yeah. obviously raised by these, these discussions. That is such an important question. Thank you for raising it. You sound like you know much more about this than I do, especially in the context of Guyana. But I know in Bolivia, in the uh, Salado Huni, which is big salt flats, they have large deposit of, of lithium, which apparently would solve, I think, most of the world's lithium supply problems. And there is a lot of resistance by indigenous peoples and other activist movements towards uh, mining that there. Um, and at the same time, and that really came, uh, came to the fore with Morales' politics, there was an expectation by you know, indigenous and other people who had been sidelined for so long that that social programs would be implemented and that poverty would be kind of addressed and alleviated through uh, some of the proceeds from these hydrocarbon um, explorations. And um, I certainly don't have the answer to the questions, but I think bringing, bringing these issues into the classroom with all of those complexities and also saying, you know, there might not be a solution. Some of these complexities and contradictions are there and they need to be, they need to be understood. Um, you know, Nancy Postero writes about that in the Bolivian context and saying, you know, we need to go back to 1492 and look at how Spain started resource extractions, the Spanish the conquistadores started the resource. That's the context, that's the historical context in which we need, we need to consider these. So again, as an anthropologist, we look at the history, we look at kind of, you know, politics and culture and, and, and kind of a really trying to develop and teach a really holistic understanding of these challenges. Um, and then also looking at how policymakers are, are dealing with that. At the same time, in my case, my classes are always guided by issues of justice and solidarity. So having those guiding values and hopefully showing students why it's important to be guided by those values also when they then go out in the world and, and do development work. Um, that's another way I think kind of in terms of talking about the ethical compasses that, that students are developing. So really difficult question. It's probably a completely you know, imperfect answer because I don't actually know, but I would say not shying away from, 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 from talking to students about that complexity is, 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 is a good start. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think there is a simple answer to that one. But thanks for the question. Let's come back to the room. And there's a couple more questions online. And thanks for everybody online for remaining engaged. But uh, at the back, you had a question. Do you want to come up to the microphone? That will allow people uh, online to hear you. Um, um, so thanks, you. Thank you. Um, I'm just, I was thinking a bit more about um, the boundaries of like creating these. Um, games in the space. Um, like I've got a kind of drama practitioner background and also thinking about how much you can use like physicality um, in spaces which people that they don't know what they're getting themselves into maybe, you know, so you can of course foreground stuff and say, you know, we're going to be getting up, we're going to be moving around the campus. Okay, that might be a limit. In some ways, some people are comfortable, uncomfortable. So I was just wondering if you've come across and like how you make your decisions around 
kind of what game might be in go do too far and might cause mm -hmm. kind of people's what level of discomfort is okay and what becomes an like, ethical question i guess yeah around, um some of these games because i think it's they're really good learning opportunities but i'm also aware of some people are much more comfortable with interacting in some ways than others so yeah yeah thank you thank you that's that's a really good question and i think from the conversations, the way the way Dom ran the class, it was a very cautious approach. So students, they first learned about those games, kind of understanding on a conceptual level, and then they started with board games. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of a real gradual approach. And then because the students ultimately themselves designed the games, I think there was an element where they might have had um, a good sense of what level of comfort was in the class. And that really only came at the end of the term. So by then there had been both a familiarity with games, but also with each other. They probably allowed students um, to gauge what was okay to do. Um, and, and from my observations, everybody, you know, engaged, engaged in those games. Uh, but I think another example that your question just reminds me of, my colleague Beth Mills, Beth Mills uses buddy mapping in her class. And I've, I've had lots of conversations with her around the level of comfort and to what extent students are, are comfortable and how she always, in her case, always says, if students don't want to do that kind of activity, then she always has a more conceptual space where students can answer or think about, you know, whether, whether it be how power manifests in the body without actually becoming physical in that way. So acknowledging the discomfort, um, allowing students to, to opt out, I think that is really important. Um, and also in the, in the design of, of the space and the activity, yeah, being really aware of, of, of some of those limits. And again, for me, it probably comes from having taught for, for, for many, many years. Um, but I haven't been in the situation, but I could see some situations where, where, where students are just saying, I, I, I don't want to do that for, for all kinds of reasons. And absolutely respecting that. I think that would be the most important thing. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? I'll give you one more chance after, um, uh, after reading these last two online, or there might be more arriving online. But um, Rebecca Webb, who you, you mentioned earlier, says, um, <laughs> thank you so much, Anka. Um, for the, and for the previous question um, about shifting between the experiential and the need for a process of verification. This is really timely, and it's something that uh, Perpetua Kirby and I are focused on in our pedagogy work on uncertainty in the, the three to 18 schooling space mm. um, uh, that will take, um, we will take that um, up in their on own April talk, probably. The, uh, the 7th. Yes. Um, uh, which is more of a comment, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's also just saying that their, their talk will happen on April 7th sure. in this space. It should yeah. be really interesting. Yeah, so that's a. Um, a, a date to uh, to note down for anybody interested in that area. Um, and Lucilla Newell um, asks about, again, shifting slightly from the, the, the classroom context. Um, she says, super inspiring, thanks Anka. I'm trying to translate this to online learning mm -hmm. with part-time students. So embodiment and connection with nature feels harder. Think of using technologies to get them out there and connect with others in their own places, but would welcome any tips. Again, yeah. it's another, significant growth area yeah. in the university that yeah. presents certain challenges with the sort of thing. I've, I've had conversations with Lysilla and also, <laughs> this is really interesting, when I started writing this book, the first lockdown happened and I wasn't teaching at the time, but um, I was thinking, oh my God, because this was all based on in-class teaching and I'm like, what does this mean for my book? Because all of a sudden it was all online learning. But it actually forced me to, to think about how some of this can be done online. And then I had um, a couple of terms of, of trying to teach this online. And um, uh, using you know, interactive space padlets are really good. So I've, I think just a concrete example is um, for, the, for the Urban Futures class, when students first start engaging with Brighton, I asked them to keep a Brighton diary for a week and trace down their interactions and where they go and the, the places they like, the places they don't like, and then kind of create an artifact and bring something into the classroom and then present that. 
And it went okay the first year. And then the second year, I had to do it online. And I created a Padlet and asked students to you know, upload videos and images and stories. And the response was so much better. There were many more people doing it on the Padlet. I had the possibility, it was anonymous, but students could put their name to it. I've actually kept the Padlet, even though it's in-person teaching again, because I've realized that that space was maybe more accessible to students because of their technology use and because you know, making a short video was better than maybe building an object. Um, so I found uh, Padlets uh, and, and um, you know, Jamboards in the class work really well. What you do, of course, lose, you know, you can't play with, with blocks and, and Play-Doh and Lego. So that element of materiality and, and the sensory learning that comes with that, which I think is really important as well. Unfortunately, that is super hard to recreate. Although again, some of my colleagues, they send out activity packs to students and they actually send them crayons and, and Play-Doh. And then, and then everybody said in their rooms on the camera and actually was building together in their own spaces. <laughs> So there are ways of, of getting around it that I think take, you know, more planning. Um, so, yeah, kind of, kind of bridging that. And, um, uh, but it, I think it does take some, some extra thinking about how to reproduce that in online spaces. Yeah, yeah. yeah that is an important challenge, I think. Any final questions in the room? We are getting towards time. And, and I think, oh, there's one oh, online, just arrived. Sorry, take me a second to read these before I... There's a, um, uh, a very nice um, comment from Rebecca Webb. I'm not sure if other people online can see this, but it's a nice thanks that uh, I will okay. show you afterwards. I won't read it all <laughs> out here. But it's, and, um, and then there's a, a final comment from Peter Taylor who said, thanks again, Anchor. Great talk conversation. This might be of interest to participants also. Um, and there's a, um, uh, a paper that, um, that he cites written by him and Lee. Um, insights from an e-dialogue of practitioners on arts and transformative learning mm. from the Journal of Adult and Continuing Education that looks like a, a relevant uh, reference there. I'll, I'll get in touch with Peter. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, he's an easy man to find, I think. Brilliant. Um, in the, I'm going to have my one final question, because one of the things that, that I've got, and it's, it's this idea of critical hope is central to, to, to what you were saying today. It comes out very strongly in the book. And it's something that I've been thinking about a lot since hearing you talk about the book uh, on a previous occasion and, and spoken to other people about. And I think it's, I hadn't come across this time. I didn't know that mm. Friere used it. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's clearly so powerful. And I wonder if, particularly in the context that you alluded to of, of being very difficult to find yeah. hope in the, you know, in the current context and in a lot of the themes that we teach about. Um, is that a, a pedagogical necessity to get students to think about hope and how should we do that? And is it a question of thinking about, you know, activist alternatives? Is it, is it a practical question of sort of looking for things that could be done in an applied yeah. setting? Or is it a theoretical question about looking for, for opportunities, centralizing questions of justice that you were talking about? And how would you situate that in, in the context? Or are there situations in which you, you would be prepared to say, well, actually, in this context, hope is a difficult thing to, to identify? Yeah. I think it's definitely both conceptual and practical. Um, and I'm really fortunate to teach modules where I can do this. So I teach a course on activism. So it's a, a very easy for me to, you know, to, to talk about um, reframing international development as activist engagement. Um, for me, it actually, I didn't start off with hope. I started off with students coming to me and saying consistently, oh my God, I've, you know, started uni, want to do development. You know, yes, I know I came in really idealistic assumptions, but I feel really depressed. I feel really cynical because, you know, we are very, very critical in global studies, absolutely necessarily so, but it has an effect on our students. And because I did this research, which actually, again, came from these comments that I was just hearing office hours. So for me, it was like, okay, we have these reactions. Um, 
I felt that I personally had to do something in my teaching practice to address those. I couldn't just ignore those because they were so consistent and because I then also realized I wasn't the only one getting these comments just by talking to my colleagues. So that's how it started for me. I didn't start off with hope. I started with students telling me that they were becoming quite, quite hopeless. And then it became hope. And then I had these kind of reactions. Oh, well, how can you talk about hope, right? And that's kind of really naive and a bit childish. And, you know, we can't be hopeful because the world is awful. And so I moved towards critical hope. I kind of, I didn't make up that term, but for me, it was important. And then I've discovered other people who have written about critical hope in, in really eloquent ways. Um, so it is, it is important to think about kind of conceptually and, and, and what hope actually means. And lots have been written from all kinds of disciplines, right? Kind of psychology and philosophy and, and critical theory. But for me, it's really important that it's also practical. And I think that can just connects in my belief in, in learning by doing. It's just one of my central strategies. I think that's how I, you know, want to teach my students. So it is both. Are there situations where hope is inappropriate? Uh, right now, I feel like we're probably coming really close. But then again, I talk to my students and, you know, I, I go into my activism class and, and one of the groups is actually focusing on doing a campaign around um, uh, Ukrainian refugees and looking at, again, exclusions that are starting to happen there. And that, that gives me hope because they are engaging with that and they're saying, you know, what can we, what can we do, what can be done? So it starts with students and it also comes back to students. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. That's a, a good note to end on, I think. It's, uh, there's a number of other very positive, um, enthusiastic messages of thanks that, uh, that I won't read out, but you will have them. Um, so thank you very much for your engagement online. Thanks very much, everybody, for, for coming in person. Um, we're very lucky to have you in the school. I think you continue to thank inspire you. <laughs> in these ways. It, uh, it is, uh, it's great to be thinking about these sorts of issues in detail, particularly, I think, at the time, like, uh, like the present one. So thanks very much, everybody. Um, I think we can close the, uh, the seminar now.